Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at thechangeleader.com. This episode of Changing Higher Ed is sponsored by Perdia Education, a national leader in online student recruitment and enrollment services, providing institutions enrolled students risk-free on a performance-based model with no long-term contract. If your online programs could benefit from incremental online student enrollments, visit perdiaeducation.com. That's P-E-R-D-I-A education.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our guest today is Dr. Meredith Wu, president of Sweetbriar College and former director of the International Higher Education Support Program at the Open Society Foundation. Marilyn also has served as the dean of the College of Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Virginia. Meredith joins us today to talk about the Sweetbriar Revival, or as some say, the Sweetbriar Miracle. Within six months of her becoming president at Sweetbriar, the college underwent a comprehensive restructuring consisting of an academic reset that replaced general education with a core curriculum on women's leadership, tuition reset which brought down the published tuition from $50,000 a year to $21,000, and a curricular realignment that brought the number of majors from 42 to 16. And in the fall following the restructuring, first year enrollment went up by 42%. This is a classic change management project, and whereas it may seem like it happened overnight, every miracle or change management project is the result of a lot of hard work behind the scenes, and Marilyn joins us to talk about those very things. Meredith, welcome to the show. I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this ever since I heard about Sweetbriar five years ago. The story has just struck me. And then the ability, you know, your your willingness to come on the show. I'm just so happy you're here. It's going to be fun. Thank you. So let's just jump into it. Sweetbriar has been a woman's college for many years. It's been always a woman's college to my knowledge. And at about six years ago, actually six years ago yesterday, the board announced that it was going to close the institution. Tell me a little bit about that, if you would. As you said, Drum, Sweetbriar was born as a woman's college. It has, for the last 120 years, educated women from all over the world all over the nation. It is a a liberal arts college as well. Drum, it is located in the middle of Virginia. It's um, in between the coastal Virginia and Blue Ridge Mountains, occupying the most exquisite area in that Piedmont, Virginia, about 3,000 acres. And uh, as you mentioned that in 2015, exactly six years ago, the decision was made to close it. I don't know why the decision was made really, but I can I can take some educated guess. You know, it was really for the last 30, if not 40 years, that uh, folks, the best intelligences in higher ed have been talking about the perilous nature of being private liberal arts institutions in this country. It has always been said for the last three decades that being a liberal arts college may be a risky proposition because parents don't want their kids to be educated in the liberal arts. They prefer to have them get some tradable skills. And two, it's a perilous idea to be a single gender institution because frankly, young girls don't wanna go to a women's college. It is often said that 93% of prospective women students don't even think about going to women's college. And three, it's often been said that prospective students don't wanna be in any place that's rural. So liberal arts college, single gender in rural Virginia was probably a wrong idea at the wrong time in the wrong place. 
And so I suppose that if you looked at the prospect for a college like Sweetbriar, having those three structural characteristics, that one can imagine why some people came to the conclusion that it perhaps is best all around to uh, call it quits. Well, that makes perfect sense. The board made the decision to close it. You had a relatively good size endowment, $84 million at the time, but $19 million of it was unrestricted. It didn't seem to me, you know, in retrospect, that it was the right decision. But, you know, be that it is May, the decision was made. The women alums, they stepped up. Yes, that's very important because once you hear that being a liberal arts college is a wrong idea, being a woman's college is at the wrong time, and being in rural Virginia, no matter how spectacular and exquisite, is a really uh, kind of wrong place, the alumni immediately kind of cocked their heads and they thought, well then, shouldn't it be that you try to make it so that liberal arts education is the right idea? Single gender place is really the idea whose time has come and that being in rural Virginia that everybody loves is probably being in the right place. And so uh, that's how all the struggle to get the college back really started. I was told this interesting story that uh, when the decision was made and the announcement was about to go out through the New York Times, that this venerable woman's college was about to close, that the meeting took place between the administration and the top donors. The head of the college explained as best as could why it was inevitable that the school had to close. There was a stunned silence, complete shock, dismay prevailed. After a certain silence, finally one octogenarian alum speaks up. She says, on the other end of the phone line, she says, excuse me, but this is bullshit. This is apparently how uh, the prairie fire got started. The alums got motivated. They uh, organized themselves into groups really rapidly, into groups to uh, handle communications, group to handle fundraising, group to handle uh, legal issues, as there were a lot of uh, lawsuits in order to get the key back to the college. One thing I can say about the alumni at Sweetbriar is that they really exemplify the best virtues of American womanhood. They're strong people. They're very practical. They're resilient. They are fantastic problem solvers. They know how to roll up their sleeves and get things done. And they know how to make decisions, big decisions, and they go for it. And so uh, to have this group of alumni mobilized to get the college back was uh, really a really interesting case study in what I might even call social mobilization. I suppose we'll have to write a book about this because, uh, you know, there is really nothing like this. Well, it could be a wonderful, and I'm sure it is a wonderful case study in education colleges around the country of how to turn around an institution. So let's get into that part. The president dismissed the administration, the board. You got students back, faculty and staff came back. He was there for a couple of years, and then you came on board and you did a comprehensive restructuring, academic reset, reducing tuition, reducing the number of majors. Now, before coming to Sweetbriar, you were working with George Soros, Open Society Foundation. How did that change? How did that help your thinking in moving through this whole process? Probably one of the greatest legacies for uh, social work that George Soros has done is in higher education. He has, in his lifetime, supported over 200 higher education institutions around the world, especially in authoritarian countries so that you can create citizens who know how to do critical thinking to improve their political and social conditions. You know, one thing that I learned running global higher education program was this. 
until that moment, I actually never really had close interactions or experience with single gender education. But uh, one of the colleges that we supported is a university in Chiragong, Bangladesh called Asian University for Women. One of the remarkable things that we were able to do when there was a genocide going on in Myanmar with regard to the Rohingya people. And the Rohingya folks, uh, really, as the result of uh, centuries of oppression, they had not been able to create anything that resembles a stratum of leadership. You could count number of people that graduated with college degree with your one hand. We were able to move about 100 women who are Rohingyas out of the refugee camps and other areas where they were living to a nearby college, which happened to be in Chiragong, Bangladesh, Asian University for Women. To make the long story short, you know, when uh, my colleagues and I transported, in effect, these many women, Rohingyas, into that university, at first we found young women who were fearful, who are frightened, who are scared for the future, with all the reasons to be feeling that way. About a year later, when I went back, the changes that came to these women were absolutely incredible. I found the women who were protected, women who felt safe, women who were confident, so confident that they were almost in your face. <laughs> and they were pain in the butt. And uh, women who were very communicative, and women who also felt supported by other women in the university. The younger ones looked up to the older ones for guidance, for mentorship, and for companionship. You know, it was a really wonderful thing to see. It was a kind of hierarchy, but a very nice, benign hierarchy that I saw. And for the first time, it, it occurred to me that this would not have happened in a co-ed institution. I mean, certainly this is a very extreme kind of situation involving people who really desperately needed protection and empowerment. But to see that in a single gender place, that empowerment could take place in that manner was an eye opener for me. And so after that experience, perhaps going to rural Virginia or let's say Piedmont, Virginia, to a, a woman's college uh, with a venerable history and in a much happier setting was not really too much of a transition. And it also, I would guess, it also gave you a very different perspective on how women, people, women but in particular, can pull together and make something happen in a turnaround fashion. Absolutely, Drum. It is amazing what women can do, what can happen when women are in charge. I'm aware of it every day and uh, it's just wonderful. As we talk about the change management, because what you had to do was a turnaround situation and you know the extreme of change management. We typically use the what we call the iceberg theory of change, where what you see floating above the water is the output, but below that you have the processes, underneath that you have structural changes, and then you've got people's mental models being represented by the water floating around the iceberg. You had to do a lot of changing. Let's start with probably what's a little bit easier is the structural changes. We'll come back to mental models in a little bit because those are those can be the most difficult to change. How did the changes come about? What, what structural changes did you make that lent themselves to turning around Sweetbriar? Well, Drum, there is a great economist by the name of Albert Hirschman. He was in the business of what one calls economic development. And he defined development as a process where you do end runs around obstacles. And what he means by it is you just have to get creative. If uh, you got some absolute prerequisites of economic development that's missing, then you find substitutes. You do whatever you can to make things work and move the ball forward. You know, that's another way of saying what Teddy Roosevelt is often quoted as having said, you take what you have and do what you can where you are. In effect, that's I think what we did. 
the changes that we put into place divides into two parts. The first set of changes we had to put in, we had to put in yesterday. I mean, it was a series of changes that had to be in place very quickly to stabilize the college. By that, what I meant is that we were in a situation where uh, we got the college back, we put the Humpty Dumpty together, but it was very difficult to get the students back because they had already committed to elsewhere. So we had like 84 faculty members and we had like 230 students. And so, you know, you can imagine the imbalance, what that portends for the future of the college when it was very difficult to get the students back in the context where the whole world now thinks that Sweetbriar is already closed. And so the first set of changes that we had to put in place to stabilize the college was as follows. We very quickly had to do a comprehensive academic overhaul. Two, we had to do financial overhaul to make sure that we were, our pricing was competitive. And then we had to do a complete budget overhaul to make sure that going forward, our budget would be sustainable. So we worked very rapidly with the faculty for academic overhaul. We tried to figure out, the first thing we tackled was how to replace our general education program with something far tighter and more effective. In terms of the pricing of the college, in terms of tuition, the way we went about thinking about this is try to figure out who are our competitors. In the climate today of uh, higher education, you know, one would have thought that our competitors are other women's colleges like Mount Holyoke, like Hollins Smith, but actually not. When we looked at our competitors, they were all state universities in Virginia, and that's a very tough proposition. Virginia has famously excellent public institutions like University of Virginia, you got Virginia Tech, and you got JMU, you have very, very excellent uh, public institutions, and students are applying to those places at, this, at the same time as Sweetbriar. So it was really critical that our pricing matches somewhat, that we can go head to head with state institutions. And so we basically slashed our tuition by half so that uh, our pricing is easy for parents to understand, it's completely clear, and it is affordable for students. And then finally, in order to make the budget structure sustainable, not this year, not next year, but going forward in perpetuity, we basically had to eliminate the majors from 40 plus to 17 which we did, and uh, miraculously, we were able to do that in some orderly manner. And so we put all these uh, changes in place to stabilize Sweetbriar. So that was step number one. And once that was done, then we moved to do the really fun part, which is to try to figure out how to make Sweetbriar truly distinctive that Sweetbriar becomes a household name for those students that really have some particular interest. We then focused on two things that we have a really good shot at for being truly distinctive. One is women's education, women's leadership. You know, we have, as I mentioned earlier, Drum, we got rid of Janet program, which is fairly generic but in its place we put a leadership program because we believe deeply that an effective leader is also a leader with the whole slew of skills and abilities that we try to inculcate through liberal arts education, except that through the core program on women leadership, we could get to the end point much quicker than your usual run-of-the-mill liberal arts general education program. So we have been working really hard to make our women leadership program, general education program, as tight and as excellent, as brilliant as possible, so that uh, we can really shine in that regard. The other thing that we clearly have the ambition to be better than practically anybody else is in the education of sustainability. Sustainable in terms of political sustainability, 
social, economic, business, and ecology of our society. We have begun to make serious investment on teaching our students how to think about sustainability for themselves, for our community, and for the world. This is also critical for us because we believe that for liberal arts colleges, doing education that's experiential, hands-on, in-person, is going to be very important for survival in the post-pandemic world. This has been a really good part. We put in 20 acres of vineyard. We put in a fantastic apiary to produce honey for ourselves. Above all, we put in 27,000 square foot smart farm on campus so that our students can eat the produce they make in the greenhouse, which is only 100 yards away from the dining hall. We produce to sell in the local area. We produce to teach ourselves how to produce. This has been great. We now have 70 students that are part of the sustainability club. I think that the experience of growing things for yourself and for others has been just wonderful for our students. That sounds fabulous. You know, an idea comes to mind is maybe farm to table right there, you know, 100 yards away. Culinary arts may be the next major for you. Who knows? Well, you know, who knows? Uh, <laughs> You know, the possibilities are endless. But there is a reason why we have zeroed in on sustainability. Well, one obvious reason is because we happen to be situated in a beautiful place. We used to have a farm throughout the 20th century. The only problem was that the farm wasn't intellectually related to the college itself. But, you know, this is no brainer that we would make use of our 2,800 acres of most complex and fertile ecology. But uh, there are really other reasons that made us think that uh, this is the way to go. And that has to do with location. I keep talking about us being located in Piedmont, Virginia. And that's a very important fact. The most important sector in the private economy of the Commonwealth of Virginia is agriculture. The second most important is tourism. And we looked at it and we said, bingo, we are the solution for the state of uh, Virginia in this regard, located wh where we are in between Lynchburg and Charlottesville, number one. Number two, the Commonwealth is the fourth most important wine producing state in the nation. For us to get into this, teach our women how to plant, how to take care of grapes and how to get into the business and marketing of uh, the most important industry for the Commonwealth is really not a bad way to go, which is why we ended up with 20 acres of vineyard, you know, and also makes the campus look even more beautiful than it normally is. Above all, however, and here is what was really important to us, we believe that local agriculture is the way to go for the country for a number of reasons. If you look at the percentage of women who are primary agricultural operators in the nation, it's in the low 20s in terms of percentage. In the Commonwealth of Virginia, it's 39%, practically 40%. Women are in the business of agriculture. Well, it's you know certainly a different kind of agriculture. It's not your uh, corporate agriculture as you might find in, in uh, Iowa. It's much more artisanal kind of agriculture. There's a lot of smart farming going on. And Sweetbriar, it turns out, is one of the only women's college in this country with a fully accredited engineering program. We have engineers here on campus that can help with the agriculture that we're doing on campus, soil testing, and the water testing and all kinds of interesting things. And so for those reasons, we felt that focusing and investing in smart farming, sustainability, agriculture will yield a lot of externalities. You know, it's, it's great that you did this kind of market research to see what is needed and, and what could be sustainable going forward. No pun intended, of course. Now, the changing of people's ideas, this is always, can be sometimes the hardest, the hardest portion of change management. 
How were you able to change people's mental models around the closing and then the changes that you had to make? I mentioned Drum earlier about how the pundits in higher ed has been saying for three, four decades, the sky's fallen for liberal arts colleges. The term, the adjective that's permanently affixed in front of liberal arts colleges is struggling liberal arts colleges. That for decades you have heard the sky's fallen, you're struggling, your prospects are not good, the world is against you that external environment is really harsh. And so the first step for us is to say, you know what? That narrative is wrong. That's a crazy narrative. Sky is not fallen. It's all up to you to try to figure out how the world actually is, how it works, and try to come up with a solution on your own. And so uh, for us, it was trying to say, you know what, the time is right. The world is our oyster. Being a woman's college is a really great thing at a time when women will inherit the 21st century. Look at these young women. They are the protagonists of the new century. And aren't we so privileged to be educating these women? You know, to say rural Virginia, central Virginia, it's a blessed place. It's so exquisite. It's beautiful. This is always the place that you have loved. It is up to us to make something out of it instead of being uh, downtrodden about how uh, young people don't want to come live in rural Virginia. Besides, we're not even rural anyway. We are actually suburban according to the classification. <laughs> So, in fact, it's just living your message is what it is. I know when we spoke before, you were talking about what it means to be a woman leader, you know, how to leverage resources, the collaboration, cooperation, working with others, the selflessness, giving credit to others and working in teams. What I'm hearing from you is that's what you epitomize. That is how you work with your institution, and that's how you work with your board as well. Tell me a little bit about how the board helped you in your process going forward, because without a good supportive board, nothing works. Uh, the board has been tremendous and absolutely supportive of changes. You know, being on the board of Sweetbriar College, it's not any kind of picnic. You know, you have to work hard and you have to uh, have internal fortitude to uh, deal with some bad news and bad vibes sometimes. But uh, they have shown the members great courage and great support, you know, of course, financial support as well to push us forward at a time when we are with great diligence and difficulty building enrollment. And uh, I say with great difficulty because, you know, Drum, none of us knew what it meant to try to pull the college up from the ditch that it was in. We didn't know actually what it would mean, something really simple like, you try to recruit students, brilliant young women who will come here, but whenever a brilliant young woman types in Sweetbriar College, for years on end, the first thing that pops up is New York Times article saying that we closed, right? And so, uh, you know, there are so many ways in which unexpected difficulties popped up, but the board was always there to uh, help us, um, advise us, and uh, do the heavy lifting for us. You can't expect anything more from a board. That, that sounds like a, a dream come true. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we are getting close to the end of our time. So as we always do, wrapping up with our, our two closing questions, Three takeaways for your fellow presidents about turnaround situations. Well, in our case, the turnaround was a little bit extreme, so I don't know what uh, particular message will be useful for the fellow presidents. But I might say this, the turnaround we experienced was a business turnaround, but it's not really business turnaround. Turnaround in higher ed is business turnaround, but never really business turnaround. There are no heroes. It's not so clear cut. You are dealing with a community. In our case, it was always a very, very close knit community. To try to inject yourself in the midst of it, 
to make painful changes is going to be very messy and very difficult. And you're also dealing with the professoriate. They have been so supportive of students, and they have been the people that carry the college forward. And to impose or work with them on big changes is going to be messy. It's going to be very difficult. You know, there are no heroes. For as a college president, I say. That you just have to get ready to don sackcloth and ashes and ask for forgiveness. <laughs> yes, we we used to have a saying: it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Sometimes. Yeah, and then the second takeaway is,、uh, well, I suppose the job, the most important job of a president, is as a communicator. You just have to communicate, 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 and communicate. Good news, bad news. There is no such thing as hiding anything. Everything has to be above board. And then I suppose the third, and quite possibly the most important takeaway, is never forgetting why. Why you're doing what you're doing. It's all about students, and that it's really critical never to lose sight of it. Great, thank you. Those are those are three great takeaways. So, what's next for the Sweetbriar Miracle? Well, the mission of Sweetbriar is to prepare women to lead the world into a more just, equitable, and sustainable future. And so, the next miracle is investing, investing, investing in the college, especially the sustainable part of the future that we want to bring about. And、uh, make sure that the whole world will hear about the great experiment we're doing for the future. Well, that's neat. Well, thank you, Meredith. Thank you so much for being on the program. This has been so lovely, and we'll we'll do this again in another year or so, and just see where you've come. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was so much fun, Drum. Take care. Thanks for listening this week, and a special thank you to this week's special guest, Dr. Meredith Wu. President of Sweetbriar College, and for her sharing the story of the Sweetbriar Miracle. I also want to give a special shout out to our sponsor, Perdia Education. Visit perdiaeducation.com to learn how Perdia can help you grow your online student enrollment through a performance-based model that has no risk or long-term contracts to your institution. Changing Higher Ed is a production of the Change Leader. A consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic, along with show notes on this episode, at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show, and we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton. Post production by David L. White.